Good morning and welcome to our quarterly investment update for clients. My name is Henry Gaskin and I'm the chair of our investment committee here at SG Wealth. I'm talking to you from our Ipswich office, albeit I am in solitary confinement here as we find ourselves back in lockdown again. Um, however, I'm pleased to confirm that my colleagues are working from home uh, very efficiently and effectively, I hasten to add. Um, being in lockdown, it's, it's quite nice to see a few of the images on these slides of our fantastic East Anglian countryside to remind us all of the outside world that I'm sure we'll all be able to fully enjoy again soon. All the images uh, that you'll see today are taken by local photographer Rick Bowden, whom we are supporting this year as part of our community engagement uh, work at SG Wealth. There will actually be many more of Rick's photos on our new website, which we are excited to be launching in a couple of weeks time. So, so please look out for that in your inbox soon. But turning to today though, I am absolutely delighted to welcome Ben Kumar as our guest speaker on today's call. Uh, ben is a very well-known industry voice in his role as senior investment strategist at 7IM. Uh, 7IM themselves are very well known as an investment firm and they're very well respected by us and the industry at large. They were founded back in 2002 by seven founding partners, principally to look after their own family's money. But, but since then, they've grown to a, a company that employs over 400 people and has around £17 billion of assets uh, under management through their various activities. Now... Whilst not, of course, looking to dismiss the severity of the situation we, we all find ourselves in, I'm sure you, you might well agree that over the last year we've all spent you know, a, a good deal and maybe quite enough time hearing and speaking about, about COVID. So I'm glad to say that, that Ben's presentation today will be more forward looking. Um, he will consider what the key themes will be for us economically in, in a, a post-COVID world. My presentation afterwards will be a little bit more retrospective um, as I'll look to reflect on some of the activity we undertook last year within clients' portfolios, really to share some of our decision-making process uh, with you as clients. Before I though hand over to Ben though, um, just a quick housekeeping point. We hope there will be the opportunity for um, some questions to be answered at the end of the session, time permitting. Um, if you do have any questions, please do submit them as we go. There is a question and answers function in the meeting in Zoom. Um, so just submit the question online if you, if you may, and then we'll address them at the end. If there's anything too specific um, or if we run out of time, then of course we'll come back to you after the presentation. So that's all from me for now. So without further ado, I think I'll hand over to Ben um, to take you through his thoughts. Thanks, Henry. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for um, taking the time um, to to listen to to what Seven IM and SG have to say. Um, hopefully, you should be able to to see the slides. Um, something we all want to do, I think, is leave twenty twenty behind us. Um, I think it's very difficult to say that anyone had the year they imagined they might, and I think for everyone in the country and indeed the world, it's been a real, real challenge. Before we go into what, what 2021 and beyond might hold, I just want to share with you something that at 7 am we think is quite important and a useful analogy for, for thinking about the world. It certainly helped us in, in 2020. Um, and it's a way we look at the markets. Now, when we talk about investing, we're aware that all the time, regardless of what you might read about robots, about computers, about how trading is automated, any of those scare stories, ultimately it comes down to humans. And as humans, we have certain characteristics that are very difficult to overcome. Now, when you look at the human brain, there are various different sections of it. And this is obviously not an exact scientific model you're seeing in front of you, but roughly the outer bit, the orange bit on the screen is the neocortex and it is used for rational thinking. It's, you, it's the bit that's most like a computer. It looks at inputs and outputs and does complicated analysis. It's the bit that can you know, make you 
decide what you want to do with your day, whether it's listen to a webinar or go for a walk in the sunshine. It can plan, it can think. The next bit, the blue bit, is the mammalian system, often called the limbic system as well. And this is common in all mammals, as you'd expect. It's capable of quite complex stuff, actually. It can love, it can remember, if you think of a dog you know, or a cat. Cat recognizes the owner and knows, knows that things like when feeding time's happening or when a walk might be happening. It's complex, but it, it's not, not the human bit, right? It's not a bit that sets us apart. The problem is when we get into the, the purple bit on the screen, the, the bit that sits at the top of the spine. That's the basal ganglia, the reptilian complex, and it's found in everything from, from lizards upwards. And we call it the lizard. We call it the lizard because it's the most problematic part of the brain. It sits at the top of the spine because it, it needs to react quickly. It's what's kept lizards alive for hundreds of millions of years. And as humans, sometimes it's really useful. The lizard can help us when we're crossing a road and a car is coming too fast. Right? That's reflexes, it's instinct. You don't need the neocortex making complicated calculations about velocity and momentum. You need to move out of the way of the car or catch a ball or whatever it is. So sometimes it's good. Other times, though, the lizard can get overwhelmed. It's trained to respond to everything, and it's not trained for the 21st century. So when something unexpected happens, even though it may not be a car, it may be something like waking up in the morning and seeing coronavirus spreads across the world in the headlines, or FTSE falls 5 10%, the lizard still reacts. And controlling the lizard is our shorthand in the 7IM world for trying to play down those reactions as investors and engage the neocortex bit around our brain. Now, we've got a few ways of doing that that you know, I'm sure we can share another time, little processes, little tricks. But it's this that I'm going to try and, and share with you today, not thinking about short term reactions to COVID and vaccines and you know, the new president in the United States, trying to think longer term, because that's how investors should think. To be clear, though, 2020 was not a good year for lizards. Right? As you can see by the popularity of unprecedented in Google searches, that's exactly what the lizard hates. It's those kind of scary situations which mean rational people, who I'm sure you know, we, all, we all know, ended up stockpiling, ended up going to supermarkets and buying 50 bag, bags of pasta. So if we can overcome the lizard and think long term, actually you can end up making better investment decisions. The panic in March that we saw, that first day of lockdown, the 23rd of March, right across, across the, the UK or England rather, that was the day global equity markets hit their bottom. So the very scariest day, the worst moment for, for many people, the most uncertain, the most frightening time, that was when the best moment to invest money in 2020 occurred. Now, we're not saying you should be trying to time the market. We'd never say something like that. But it tells you that that was definitely the wrong time to be selling out of the market. Let's move on then. Let's look at 2021 and beyond. Let's try and take the lizard out of the equation and think about some of the longer term themes that investors are going to have to deal with. Hopefully, I'll spend about 15 minutes on this and any questions, as Henry said, we can kind of take at the end. So thinking differently, thinking long term. In 2021 and beyond, the problems that the world faces are unlikely to be global. Because COVID-19 was that rarest of things, something that affected the whole world at roughly the same time, prompting exactly the same response from governments of all kinds and stripes and colours all over the world. When we think about what's coming in the future, though, the likelihood, the strong likelihood is that we won't see a global crisis again in the next few years. Of course, you never say never and you need to have preparation in place. But most likely you'll go back to, to thinking about what can happen in terms of regions. You know, what is the outlook for South American commodity exporters? What is the outlook for the United States and, it, and its consumer as we exit the recession? How does that look in somewhere like Russia? What happens in China as growth gets going again, or rather never stopped? 
and Africa, the development, the investments we're seeing there. Thinking about the world in a more diverse way is likely to be important. And it's especially important, I think, thinking about other areas of the world, because in the UK, it can often be very hard to look beyond the headlines. You know, when something happens in the UK, political or related to the virus or economic, it can be difficult to remember that the UK is 5% of the world. And as investors, we want to be investing in the whole world. So thinking globally and trying to move beyond, you know, the sense that everything either happens to everyone or that it will only matter in the UK is really important. Picking and choosing where to invest and why to invest. Second thing I want to, to bring up as something to, to think about is something not to think about. The US election every four years is relentless. Every four years for the past 12 years, I've written an article about two months before the election that says, do not focus on the US election. The politics is irrelevant. But it's so difficult not to focus because everyone in the world gets sucked in. When you look at this chart, though, you can see that US economic growth does not care about elections. There are things like the financial crisis it does care about. There are things like COVID you can see at the end of the, end of the chart where the line, the purple line, pink line, is US economic size, the GDP, and the election years are blue. COVID affects that line. Election cycles really don't. That's really, really important because politics is so prevalent in the news at the moment. But what I'd encourage anyone who's thinking about investing, whether it's the US or not, is think about what the, the economic trends are that matter. And the US fundamentally is you know, the most capitalist, creative destruction uh, enabling society in the world. As they exit COVID, you know, there will be failing businesses in the US, but there will be people looking to pick up those failing businesses and turn them around, or to say, well, that's fine, we'll move on and start the next one. The US election, despite the fact, particularly this week, it's going, going to get a lot of emphasis, is not going to be as important as it seems. Ignoring politics and thinking about economics and longer term trends is absolutely the way to invest for, for the next year and the next decade. And on that theme, when we think about some of those longer term trends, demographics is incredibly powerful. I've got a couple of slides on this that I just wanna share quickly. The aging of the world is something that is not going to stop. In places like China, they're already tipping over into the point where, where the, the young people are starting to be outnumbered by the old. There will be more older people in China than younger people within the next couple of years. In places like Italy, in places like Japan, and in places like the UK, you know, we're almost already there. In Italy and Japan, we definitely are. And when you think about aging, it's, I think, I'm an optimist, I think it's an incredibly positive story. Because what we've got now is the situation where lots of people are getting old and they're staying old for longer because we are so much better at preserving human life. We're seeing it with, with in a very acute sense with, with COVID, but you know, in general, we are so much better at, at curing things like cancer, treating diseases, you know, keeping people alive for longer. And that's an important theme for investors because as people age, they tend to, to focus their spending on one particular thing, more life. So healthcare providers, those businesses that are looking to cure diseases, looking to make sure that life is you know, longer for everyone, are going to be a growth industry in a way that, that perhaps has not been seen before um, over the next decade. Because lots of those healthcare providers have seen the same things that we're seeing. Most, and I really mean most, something like 75% of research and development at the moment, well, sorry, this is last year, perhaps now it's on COVID-19, but 75% of research is directed at, at treatments for diseases for those aged over 65. That's globally. You know, this is a growing market, often with capital to spend, 
who who really want something very simple. They don't want to go and spend money on clothes and, and new toys. They would just like to stay healthy for longer. So it's a positive investment in in the way I see it. It's investing in longer lives uh, with pe- through investing in healthcare. Another thing, this is a great picture. I'm sure you, you've seen versions of it, but there are more people living inside this circle in, in Asia than there are living outside of it. This de- demographic heft that Asia has is really now reaching a tipping point because although this circle would have you know, still been pretty well populated 20 years ago, the economies within it were not. India, China, Indonesia, South Korea, Taiwan, 20, 30 years ago, were still very much emerging market economies. It still had a very big problem with poverty, uh, were still not particularly educated and were not particularly rich. That has changed and is continuing to change extremely fast. And as it does, the outlook for investors becomes very different. Because in the past, you know, the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years post Second World War, you've invested in Western companies, developed world companies that have been selling goods to those the, the markets in this circle. They've been selling Western goods to, to Asia. That's changing because now the biggest car companies in China are Chinese car companies. They're not the Land Rovers and BMWs and Volkswagens. It's companies with Chinese branding that are appealing to the mass consumer. In India, purchasing of Western branded goods is falling away as some of the Indian competitors, whether it's in clothing, whether it's in motorcycle manufacture, whether it's in in what you shop for in the local shop. Indian competitors are, are now as hygienic, their quality is as good, and they have a, a, a keener understanding of the market they're selling to. So thinking about how Asia in particular, although all emerging market economies, how those demands and consumer trends change is massively important for the next few years, next few decades, because those trends are going to change the world. And it may be that the next Unilever or Procter & Gamble is actually in China, selling to Chinese consumers. And when you've got 1.4 billion consumers or 1.2 billion in India, actually you can become a a global sized company very, very easily in a way that perhaps a Western business can't. Another thing I think has been notable in terms of attitude shift, actually through 2020 most particularly, is the attitudes towards the environment towards climate change, towards what's called ESG investing, environmental, social and governance considerations being taken into account. Now, what we had here was was a slide that we put up at the start of 2020. And if you remember, I know it's a long time ago, but a year ago, there were fires, forest fires burning, burning their way across Australia. And what we showed was that in New Zealand, uh, that one of my one of my team members' sister lives in Auckland in New Zealand, you know, the sky was yellow 1,600 miles away from those forest fires, from those bushfires. And we thought that was going to be a key theme over the next decade. You know, this was a year ago. ESG, people starting to take climate change very seriously. We've seen a real shift over the past year. People have been sitting at home thinking about how important the world is to and attitudes are shifting. You know, Joe Biden is riding that popular wave when it comes to investment in green infrastructure. But it's a wave that's been growing for some time. And I think it's made it to the mainstream. My rough rule of thumb here is when you've been sitting watching TV, as I'm sure everyone has over the last year, how many adverts for electric cars and hybrid cars do you see from mainstream manufacturers who even a year ago weren't doing that? Audi, Volkswagen, BMW, they're all pushing electric cars, Lexus. This shift towards a consumer who is willing to either pay a premium for green products or just thinks that green products are in fact better than the other products, that shift is happening. There's a long, long way to go, but I think it's something to be very aware of when investing. 
you know, previously green was seen as a luxury. Now it's in the mainstream and being dirty is going to be something companies have to have to address. Briefly, I'd like to mention inflation because we've been very lucky over the last 10 years and not really seen any inflation. A lot of people are, are, are worrying, I think, and have, have certainly asked us, you know, what's our expectation for inflation? I put US inflation here, but the story is roughly the same with the UK, uh, added with a few sort of Brexit impacts put in. So is inflation suddenly going to rise? Is it going to sharply spring up like, like we saw in the 70s, you know, heading for double, double digits, uh, you know, beyond 10, 20 percent? The answer is no. Lots of the conditions in the 70s, if we take the UK, are no longer in place. Unions having incredible wage bargaining power for most of the working population is not the case anymore. Oil prices in 19, between 1973 and 1974 quadrupled overnight because OPEC started putting embargoes on things. OPEC's not a power anymore. In fact, three of the top five oil producers in the world aren't in OPEC, the US, Canada, and China. So the possibility for runaway inflation does seem to be very low. However, a really important point is that even if inflation hits the, the target, the global central bank's target of around 2%, that's still worth concern yourself about as an investor. If your retirement horizon is 20 years or so, 2% inflation over 20 years means that the value of your capital drops by one third. Your £100 of spending power will be worth £66. So even moderate inflation needs careful investment in order to, to preserve the, the capital, the value of that capital. We think quite a lot about it, and I won't, I won't go into it here, but it is the key concern, particularly for our cautious investors, is making sure that we can beat even a reasonable inflation target. It should be at the heart of anything any advisor does, um, and, and I think that's very much true with, with Henry and the team. Finally, a quick word on a trend that's been happening in investment management over the last 10 years. People have been buying passive products and passive products have outperformed. By passive, I mean you buy the FTSE 100 in its exact weights, or you buy the S&P 500, the US equivalent, or the Topics, the Japanese equivalent. And you don't give your money to someone who's trying to pick the best stocks, you just buy the whole index. While that can be a very sensible, low cost way to invest, and at times will outperform many of the active stock pickers out there. We do believe there is a place for active management and it started to, to come through over the past year. Active managers, some of them get a bad name, deservedly so, because they overcharge for doing basically nothing. But some of them have the right idea. They're competitively priced. They have a process. And above all, what they're trying to do, which gets to the heart of active management, is pick the good companies and avoid the bad companies for the coming 10 years or so. And if you can find someone who's good at that, Warren Buffett being a, a great example here, underperforming the market for the last five years, does it mean he's a bad investor? No, of course it doesn't. Look at some of the companies listed here in, as part of his Berkshire Hathaway empire, and they're incredible businesses. They might not be valued as incredible by the market at the moment, but over time, Boris, uh, sorry, Warren Buffett picks winners. He avoids the losers. We think that's still a sensible thing to do. As long as you can find the right person, as long as you trust them, that kind of investing will always have its place in the world. Passive doesn't have to be the dominant factor when there are still very clever people out there looking for businesses that are better than other businesses. So in the decade ahead, in the year ahead, the decade ahead, there are lots of things to think about. But I would encourage anyone listening to, to try and think long term about all of the issues I've just mentioned and anything else. It's that kind of mentality that means we can try to keep capital invested, to keep growing capital in, in interesting areas of the world and try and have some comfort that we can look beyond the headlines, look beyond the day to day uh, and, and you know, sit back, relax and enjoy our portfolios being well invested. It's a difficult thing to do, but it's absolutely the most important thing for the long term.
Thank you. Great, thanks, Ben. Yeah, so yeah, thanks, Ben, for that. It's ties in very well with what I want to talk about today. There's indeed there's a there's a lot of synergy between what you're saying and the sort of themes that we've been thinking about um, over last year and and indeed looking forward. Um, what I'm looking to do with my presentation is really talk about how we control our own lizards here at, at SG Wealth really. Um, talk you through how our investment process sort of leads to investment decisions um, and how we look at both those some longer term themes that sort of Ben talked about, but also, you know, when, when we do need to act on sort of more short term matters on behalf of our clients. So this, this first slide, I'm gonna show a number of charts really that should help explain some of the ideas. This, this first slide though, just really looks back at 2020 um, in stock markets. Um, and it certainly will be a year that um, will live long and hard in the memories for, for so many reasons. Um, the, the chart shows global stock markets um, from different parts of the world. And um, whilst it will be a, a year we look to put behind us and, and we'll all be keen to forget, it's one I think we as investors can learn a lot from. And indeed, you know, we talked about that in our investment commentary, which we sent out to clients in the last week or so. In that document, we talk about three key lessons. Um, the first one of which is actually how how risk and, and volatility in markets can really manifest itself at very short notice and that that clearly was seen in in february and march with those severe falls we saw in stock markets um the second theme though is one which ben sort of um very sort of appropriately talked about was the the longer the longer term nature of investment and how by by staying that course and taking that long-term view uh you will be rewarded and indeed, you know, that was actually shown really quite quickly with the, the strength in the, in the recovery in markets really from that late March uh, bottom. The third theme we talk about as well in our, in our commentary is one of diversification and how that is actually very important in both managing risk, um, but also delivering returns for people. And again, that ties in with what, what Ben was talking about earlier. Um, on this chart, the blue line is the return from the UK stock market, um, which delivered a return of minus 10% over the, over the calendar year. Thankfully, for, we do believe in, in globalisation and global diversification, and our portfolios are well diversified globally, and therefore, you know, they um, delivered some decent positive returns during the year, thanks in, in the main to our overseas exposure that we hold. Diversification is also something we look to do um, at a fund level um, to spread risk and, and manage risk. Usually we look to hold around about 20 funds at any one stage in a, in a portfolio for clients. Um, and each, each of those funds will have their own role. It will have their own purpose. And it's, it's selected to really sort of complement the other funds that are, that are there. We're not, not expecting every fund to perform well at every period of time. Indeed, you know, we want funds that sometimes will perform badly because those are the ones that will perform well when other funds are performing badly. And really our interest is how the portfolio as a whole will perform. This is an example. This is a fund, uh, the BlackRock European Absolute Alpha Fund, which is the blue line on this chart um, and show, which shows how it performed last year. This, this is the fund actually invests in European shares. Um, but it does so in a, in a risk controlled manner. It uses some hedging and some short selling strategies to control risk. Now, this actually is a fund that we didn't really take any action on last year. We, we bought it originally in 2019, but we held it throughout last year. And it's a good example of that, that longer term sort of staying the course. The, it did very well for our clients, I think, when, when markets fell in March. You can see, you know, whilst it did decline a couple of percent, it really you know, managed to sort of navigate through the volatility in, in global assets in, in the spring and then deliver some, some decent returns throughout the remainder of the year. More recently, um, particularly sort of in November, the period in green that's highlighted, the fund did lose a little bit of money for us um, when global equities, which are the, the orange line on this chart, actually performed very well on the back of the positive sort of vaccine news. 
Now, for us, that was not a problem because other parts of the portfolio were were doing well at that time. And and the, the fund you know, is one that we continue to hold and, and held through that period because it served its purpose very well as a good diversifier. And we, we think it will still, still do that against future unexpected market conditions. This next slide is a, is a fund um, which we did take some action on last year. Um, and it's a similar diversifier that was held in the portfolios. It's the H2O Multi Returns Fund. Now, this chart is slightly longer term, looking at performance over three years. And you can see um, the periods highlighted in yellow um, in 2018, when global equities again were volatile and, and fell, this fund very much served its purpose in, in actually making some good money for clients and softening those sort of choppy waters that we sort of found ourselves in for, for shares. But this is an example I wanted to share with you of, of something fundamentally changing that, that triggers us to take some action. Um, because the period in green that's highlighted was something that we were not expecting. Clearly, you know, we weren't expecting stock markets to fall with the pandemic. Um, that was an, an, you know, a novel experience, but we were not expecting this fund to be as correlated to that decline that happened, as you can see um, it was. And, and also more importantly, we weren't expecting it to have the, um, the drawdown that it did, the downside risk that it did during this period. Um, the fund lost about a third of its value. Now, I hasten to add, it was a very small position in our client's portfolio, so it, the material impact was not huge. But this was a fundamental change in our understanding of how this fund would and should behave. So as an investment committee, we, we then scrutinised the position. We met with the managers multiple times to really understand why that was and actually what the prospects were going forward. And actually, they, they um, informed us that the, the prospects were quite positive for, for recovery in the fund. Now, we sold the fund in November, as the arrow indicates, um, quite thankfully, after a couple of good leaps up in performance. So the, the impact of the volatility earlier in the year was not as marked for our clients. But still, we decided it was something we needed to act to. We needed to sell the position because the role that we held it for was one that we could no longer trust it to, to serve. This, this next chart actually is, is another example of a fund that we sold, albeit for, for a different reason. And it's one that we actually sold somewhat reluctantly. It's a topical matter and one I wanted to comment on. Um, the blue line in this case is the Legal and General UK Property Fund, a fund that invests in, in physical UK properties. It owns office blocks, warehouses and the, and the like. The fund enjoyed a, and still does, a good level of rental income and the returns in the six years that we held the fund, you know, dating back to the middle of 2014, were very good as, as this slide shows. Um, it returned nearly 40% for our clients, um, despite some volatility back in 2016 when we had the, the original Brexit vote and of course more recently this year. But if you look at the right hand side of the chart, uh, the volatility this year was was much milder than than actually occurred in in other assets. The red line here is the UK stock market. The the turquoise line line is is listed property investments that are listed on the stock market. And again, both both of those demonstrated significant volatility with the um, the pandemic volatility in the in the spring. And the legal and general fund you know did dip a bit, but it, it provided quite a good cushion to that volatility. So, you know, given that and given over the long term actually outperformed both the UK stocks and, and the wider property market, I guess it begs the question, why did we sell it? Um, it may be, you know, you may think that possibly because fundamentally is our, our view on property as an investable asset changed. Well, yeah, maybe a little bit, but not significantly. Obviously, you know, this year has caused people to change. It's caused you know, people not to go to the office as much and and there, there might be some changes with regards to that going forward in terms of working behaviors and things and certainly shopping behaviors for for retail properties you know it will be a, a challenge 
But the, a well-run fund like this fund is one that does look long term. And some of these changes that have happened and have been accelerated in 2020 are ones that, that a good fund and a good investment house would be anticipating anyway. So a fund like this is actually well positioned to, to look ahead. It has good exposure to um, some positive sectors like distribution and logistics and much lower um, exposure to, to assets like retail and and some of the more challenged sort of office sectors so yeah that wasn't really the reason for the sale um, this was actually more driven by regulatory change and again it's a fundamental change in our understanding of the funds so just to take you back to march we we held some f property funds in our portfolio and in march Obviously, when we were peak uncertainty in terms of what the pandemic meant and where it may go, basically, um, property valuers had what we call a material uncertainty as to how they should value the, these, these major commercial properties. Um, they didn't really know what the future held. They didn't know, therefore, you know, how they should be applying valuations to these properties. And because of this material uncertainty, the FCA dictates that the funds have to suspend trading in order to protect so the, the current investors. Now, this type of what we call liquidity risk, you know, in, in terms of being access, able to access clients' money, is something actually we were fully aware of. You know, it's a risk that we are you know, fairly willing to take basically to deliver the investment experience I showed you on this on this previous slide, you know, smooth, steady, decent returns over the longer term. But but this liquidity risk is not something that sits too well with the FCA. Um, and as such, in the in August, the FCA published some consultation essentially um, that suggested in the future there may have to be a mandatory notice period on all redemptions and all monies and withdrawals out of these funds, potentially of up to six months. Now that fundamental regulatory change, um, whilst it hasn't been put in place now, is something that caused us again to reassess our holdings here. Um, and when the material uncertainty started to lift in the funds, as it did with the legal and general fund um, in the autumn, the regulatory risk is one that we felt we didn't want our, um, our clients to be exposed to. So we ended up selling the position. So those a couple of uh, ideas I've just talked about are ideas of where we, we do think there are, you know, from time to time, you know, needs to, to, to take action. The next couple of slides are actually um, about a couple of things we bought. Um, obviously, you know, we can't, we, yeah, whenever we sell things, there's, there's um, capital to deploy. Um, and as Ben talked about, there are decent long term themes we want to get exposure to. So. This fund I wanted to share with you as an example of one of those, um, as a fund that really does play into some of the themes actually that Ben was talking about. Um, this is a position we bought in February, really early in February, before the pandemic really sort of um, became at the forefront of everyone's minds. Now, Foresight are a fund um, house that we've dealt with for a number number of years, and we really respect their um, their judgment in particularly some of these more sustainable areas. And they launched a fund in, in 2019 that, that sort of piqued our interest. It invests in global infrastructure companies um, with, a, with very much a focus on sustainability. As you can see from the pie chart on the left there, has a heavy focus towards renewable energy and other sustainable infrastructures. It's looking to give um, ultimately clients like us exposure to assets which generate stable long-term income um, underpinned by large scale investment, you know, from um, the US investment program will be around sustainable infrastructure. In Europe, there'll be big programs around that as well, as there will be across the world. And this fund is able to sort of give our clients exposure to that. The fund obviously, you know, was launched in 2019. So it's quite a, a, a new fund with, with no assets at that stage. By the time we invested in it in February, it had grown to around 100 million of assets. Um, and today, uh, had an update from Foresight earlier in the week, the fund stands at um, 500 million of assets. So clearly, you know, other investment houses have identified this as an attractive investment for their clients as well. Just to sort of expand on why and give you an example, 
here's a, another slide which just ex, um, ex explains and goes into one of the holdings in this Foresight Fund. Um, this is their largest holding, actually, a company called Brookfield Infrastructure. It makes up about 8% of the Foresight Fund currently. Brookfield are one of the world's largest infrastructure investors. Uh, they own and operate assets across the world in utilities, transport, energy um, and data infrastructure. Um, the numbers are quite staggering, really. They, they have $91 billion of assets under management. They employ 43,000 people around the world um, and are very much a, a growing company. Um, if you look at the numbers on this slide in terms of the, um, the scale of the assets they own, again, they're staggering. Um, particularly when you think that um, all of those are then monetized uh, for the benefit of investors like us. This chart shows how our holding has performed um, since we invested in it. Um, as you can see, it didn't get off to the best start um, with stock markets crashing you know, within a month or so of the investment being made. Um, but thanks to the, the the long-term drivers behind this sort of strategy, um, the recovery in the fund has been swift and strong. Um, despite obviously a, a fall of about 25% or so in, within the first month, um, by the end of the year, the position we've held actually returned 18.5% for our clients, outperforming not only global stock markets, but also other real estate and infrastructure sectors quite significantly. I appreciate we're, we're getting a bit short of time, so I wanted to leave some time for questions. Um, just a, a couple more slides from me. Um, one last theme I'd like to mention is one which Ben has already uh, touched on, to be honest. Um, it's a theme that we sort of um, do very much share and, and reflect in our investment decisions and our investment approach, and, th and that is one of Asia. Um, these are some other slides which sort of help explain why. Um, particularly the right-hand side of this chart, uh, well, the chart on the right-hand side of this slide shows um, the projected growth of the middle class in Asia. So Ben commented on the, the phenomenal scale of the demographics um, behind uh, Asian growth. This this explains how the that um, those demographics are expanding into the middle classes and. And as um, that happens, this will be a really strong driver of, of consumption and growth on a, on a real staggering and phenomenal scale. So that's a, that's a longer term theme we want to play in our portfolios. And we did take some action last year to do so. So the blue lines on, on here are funds where we have exposure to that Asian um, growth and consumption story. And we did take a, the opportunity in the summer um, to increase our weightings to those holdings, not only for the short term, because actually Asian economies had coped with the pandemic quite well and were recovering quite well, but more importantly for that longer term um, growth potential that we've talked about. So before I wrap up, um, that was just a, a quick whistle stop tour of a couple of the uh, strategies and examples of investment decisions we've made last year, um, just to really look at the long term themes and how that feeds into an investment story, but also look at, you know, why we might need to act on the short term. I hope you find that to be of interest. Um, we will continue to actively manage our clients' portfolios on this basis. Um, Indeed, funny enough, we've got our next investment committee meeting tomorrow morning. Um, so we'll be looking ahead then again to, to what uh, the prospects are for 2021 and beyond in more detail. We do so um, very much with that long term view in mind. Um, and we do so with the twin targets of looking to deliver performance for clients and managing risk. Um, this is a slide showing the different varieties of risk and levels of risk that our portfolios um, have and how over the last five years, despite periods of volatility, you know, of, of some significance in, in 2016 and 2018 and indeed last year in 2020, um, that longer term investment approach has delivered decent returns um, in a risk controlled manner. And I think the last slide I just wanted to share was one that um, just expands on that risk control. 
Um, very much for us, every client is different here at SG Wealth. Um, and we create financial plans for them and, and every financial plan for clients are different. So we need to have different tools in our, in our armory as financial planners to, to meet their financial plans and meet your financial plans. Um, and that will mean having different levels of risk that we hold in your portfolios at different times. Um, the job of the investment committee is to control that risk, as I said, and this chart shows hopefully we've been quite successful at doing that. On the, on the y-axis, you've got the annualized returns of our portfolios. Um, portfolio A is our adventurous portfolio, our most risky, um, and the x-axis is, volat is volatility, a measure of risk. So the more risk you take, the more returns are generated. Um, and what we've been quite pleased about is that we've been able to manage that risk down for the different levels of risk, but also still deliver a meaningful real return for clients, even defensive and cautious clients, where there's still that inflationary risk to them um, in a risk controlled manner. So that's it for me for the moment. I think what I might do is throw the floor open to some questions now. Um, again, just as a reminder, before I do, please submit those online um, and we will, we will try and curate them as we go. We have had a couple in advance, so perhaps what I'll do is I'll just start with those whilst we're waiting for a few more questions to come online. Um, I talked a bit about risk at the end there. Um, one question we had in is what is the biggest risk to markets in 2021? Um, so Ben, I'll just give you a moment to think about that. Um, I guess I will yeah, probably identify an easy, easy risk to markets, which is, is around um, COVID. And I guess a, a loss of efficacy in, in, the, in the vaccines is probably a, a risk that certainly we see maybe as an outlying risk, but one that we, we should be aware of and one that probably would cause, well, certainly would cause more market volatility. So that, that's probably one I would talk about. Um, I think, you know, I'd probably say, though, we've been quite reassured. It's one that clearly, you know, our, our scientific community are, are already thinking about. Um, and um, it's one I think, you know, last year, as again, has taught us how excellent that scientific community is, you know, the, the ability to react to what happened last year as quickly as we have, again, is phenomenal, really. And I think, you know, therefore, you know, one would hope that, you know, if mutant strains do develop and that, that causes problems for our current vaccine um, rollout, then hopefully we'll be quite able to react to those. So I don't know, Ben, do you want to comment on that and maybe any other risks you, you see? Yeah, so I, th I think that's clearly one. We'd hope that it it's one that at least markets are aware of. You know, investors are seeing vaccines as good news, so they, they, they can understand the the point that any problems there would be an issue yeah i, I think what something that that is a risk that no one's talking too much about is you know, let's take the other side of that if vaccine rollout can go incredibly well you know and, the, and there is very successful in the major drivers of growth in the world so you know china us and europe including the uk um what do central banks in particular do with their interest rate policy you know i think we've seen how much low interest rates have fueled the growth of things like the property market as you know along with some of the government policies here too um if interest rates rise sharply or even probably more than more than whether they actually rise if investors get worried about rising interest rates even from you know to one percent that's something the market hasn't really had to deal with for for about a decade now so a change in monetary policy if you know if the world starts growing again really really strongly is something that investors particularly bond investors are going to have to think very carefully about so that that's a risk that isn't being talked about and probably comes from the optimistic side of my nature but uh, i think it is there yeah i'd agree i mean i think yeah the forecasts are that those interest rate rises probably won't come about you know for the short to medium term anyway but 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 sure i think it is you know if that if that growth and that that, that inflation does does pick up and um 
you know, the, the, the pent up demand that we hope will continue to fuel the recovery, you know, does really come through. I, I'd agree. It's something, you know, we need to uh, think about. And um, it is a challenge, as you said earlier, particularly for the cautious investors, isn't it? Um, you know, who naturally, you know, more traditionally have held government bonds as a, as a ballast and a sort of a, an offset to equities within their portfolio, um, all of a sudden could be actually quite a risky asset to hold so um certainly here at sg wealth it's something that we sort of consider yeah as a as a key question sort of looking forward with with um interest rates and rates yeah bond yields as low as they are how do we give our cautious uh, clients that risk management um given you know where, where rates are i don't know do, you know have you got any thoughts on sort of the other sort of assets and things that that might be helpful in portfolios to do that at all so some of the ones you've mentioned in the alternative space are are helpful um but again as you've said it, it can it takes a lot of work to find people that are doing something different that are genuinely doing something different and have a process that you can trust and understand and, and like you gave in your example know whether they're sticking to it or not so it's it's very difficult. The, the, the simple answer is that there is no silver bullet, right? It's about having a portfolio with lots of different assets, um, not all of which are, are going to do the same thing at the same time. Um, and, and, and then finally, I think it's about sensible expectations management. You know, it's very difficult to deliver returns, the, the kind of scale of returns you saw 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, you, 12 years ago now, you know, UK government bonds gave you a 5% income every year. Now they give less than 1%. You know, that 4% has gone. It, it's, it's been taken off the table. Mm. One, one question we have had in actually, which is around um, different types of assets um, that, that may or may not be appropriate for, for clients to hold in the future um, is around Bitcoin. Um, and I guess yeah, other cryptocurrencies as well. Um, um, before I put sort of our view on that, do you do you have any views on on how investable that is as a, as an asset class at the moment? Yeah, quite simply, it's not an asset class yet. It could be. You know, there there is no. We are not skeptics, nor are we kind of avid proponents. We're kind of just interested observers. By which I mean, the last asset class as in new brand new asset class to come around, to, to be invented by the financial mechanics. Last real asset class was the equity, right? The, st the stock back in the 1600s. So we've had kind of 400 years to get used to working out how equities do and don't perform. It's, we've, I think Bitcoin was invented in 2008. So we've had 12 years and it's far too short a time period to understand the real drivers that, that, that give it the kind of qualities that a, a real structural asset class investment needs. You know, I, I think that's, that's, the, that's the simple simple part of it. That doesn't mean there won't be people who become overnight millionaires in it, but that's a very different thing to investing. Yeah, yeah, I think we, we would very much share those thoughts as well. It's, it's something that we are aware of as again we you know we, we try and explore and and consider um but certainly for us it's it's not an investable yeah, asset at the moment either um indeed the regulator um the fca um shares that view very strongly um i think it issued um some warnings you know earlier in the week you know, or even last week around that very thing and um, how it was a real risk to to losing money um and actually i think it, it banned prod in, in, banned investment products that actually track uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, which came in at the start of the year. Um, so um, it's certainly not investable for us at the moment. I've, I remember something um, one of my mentors back in uh, my you know, time in the city told me, um, you know, when we were talking about some other investment strategies um, back in the early 2000s, and they said, if you, if you can't understand how it works, it's, it's not an investable asset class. And, and really, that's that's sort of where we are at the moment. But but um, obviously things do evolve and it's one we will continue to sort of question you know, in, in the future. 
Um, it's one though. If you certainly look at the charts, having sort of increased in price from four hundred by four hundred percent, sort of uh, yeah, over really sort of the last yeah last few weeks, really, um, it's it's one you'd question whether there certainly is a is a bubble in there at the moment. And and another, we've had another question about bubbles actually as well. Um, what is your view on um, the technology bubble? I guess the yeah, US tech companies and indeed tech companies in other parts of the world. You know, do you, do you think yeah you know, they are in sort of bubble territory? So have you? Do you got a comment on that at all? So I think it's very important to make a distinction, first of all, between what's going on in the technology sector now and what went on in the, the previous tech bubble in 2000. Because um, actually quite a lot of these companies, the big companies, were around in 2000, Amazon, Microsoft. Um, the difference now is that these giants that are, have risen so sharply in price, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, um, Netflix, uh, and so on, the fangs, Apple, um, compared to 2000, these guys make money. These guys make money on a, a kind of unimaginable scale. They make billions every, every quarter, hundreds of billions. So unlike the previous bubble, which was built on air essentially you know the idea that the internet was new and cool and amazing and infinite possibility people were pricing that infinite possibility these companies now are steady revenue generating monsters and some of them like microsoft and amazon when you look at the web services bit you know, actually they're a bit more like infrastructure companies they provide the backbone that makes modern life work um i think amazon's got amazon web services has an advert at the moment on tv showing all the things that they their computing power sits behind so you know these companies make money however there's a question about whether they will continue to dominate and as we come out of this covid period i think you know some of the some businesses in the world that aren't these huge giant tech companies will do better doesn't mean the tech companies have to do badly you know if the tech companies just continue to appreciate their share prices at the rate they grow their sales, you'll still see five, six, seven, eight, ten percent 10% a year uh, growth from these companies, which isn't bad. It might not be as quick as the rest of the market. You know, if the vaccine comes through, Carnival Cruise Lines will have an incredible year. That doesn't mean it's the new Google, but it just means that it's going to have a great year. Um, so in the big companies, I think it's, I think there isn't a bubble. They might just be a little overvalued relative to the market, which is fine. You know, it, it can be eased over time. There are some speculative manias out there in the tech space. And, uh, you know, I particularly think in the realm of electric vehicles, uh, you know, you, Tesla's the obvious one, but there are all these, I think the best performing stock last year was a Chinese company called NIO, is it NIO, N-I-O, listed in America that doesn't make any electric vehicles, but one day says it might. Now that is not a business model. That is a bit more like the technology bubble in 2000. One day I'll be, one day I'll make it. So th those, in those smaller companies with unproven business models, I think there is a signs of speculative excess. But that does not extend to, to the, the big, huge tech companies. Mm. So what I'm really saying is the technology sector is not the same as it was in 2000, where people didn't really know about it. It has some very different businesses now, some stable, established, massive, and others that are still speculative. So it's important to make that distinction, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I just I just sort of echo that as well. And um, I mean, certainly it's something we, we look at, certainly some of our funds and fund managers that we talk to have got exposure to those companies. We, we talk and question them um, ab about that. And um, I think if you look on a... Um, a price to earnings ratio basis you know often they, they can look expensive because that's looking at you know the price you're paying for that company share against the, the estimate of earnings for the next 12 months but harking back to sort of your earlier point about investing for the long term you know the fund managers we talk to very much have a long-term mindset you know they're looking to hold these companies for you know five ten twenty years and actually they are what they are trying to do is not just look at what the next quarter's earnings are going to be like or what the next year's earnings are going to be like you know what are the earnings going to be in five or ten years time and quite often they'll say look this is actually still is cheap you know if this you know continues to develop its earnings in the way it's doing so um yes yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah and again 
you know, if, if the price is a little bit expensive in the, in the short term, that might cause some volatility, but you've got to separate that and look at that long-term investment picture. Um, one final question, if we, if we may, um, that we've had in um, is regarding um, austerity. Obviously, you know, there's been a, a big buildup of, um, of debt um, in, in governments around the world to, to sort of counter the, to the virus. Um, and the uh, question is, is the return to austerity that we saw after the financial crisis likely, um, assuming that so we do get back to normality soon? Um, and it, so if, if it, is it likely is the first question. And, and if so, you know, what impacts may, may that have is, is the next question from an investment perspective. I don't think it's likely. Hmm. Um, I think what governments around the world, but you know, let's stick with here for now, what they are hoping is that enough growth will come through that tax rises in some areas will be enough to pay for this. Because when I think of austerity, I think of cost cutting. I don't think of tax rises. I think of cost cutting in government services, in government spending. And since 2010, that's been going on really to up until 2019. And it, it works but it works in a real painful, grating, horrible way. And what it leaves is services, public services that, that end up struggling. So if I were, you know, if I were a government now and you said, look, you've got to go and cut costs in the UK, where are you going to go and cut costs? Because most of the easy, easy cost cutting has been done. You could look at the NHS, but I will tell you right now that governments cutting costs on health services over the next 10 years is not going to be an option. Right? You, do, you don't go through a pandemic and then go, we probably need fewer doctors and nurses and we need to give them less in the way of wage rises. That, that, it's just not going to be palatable. And, and I don't think it's right either. Um, so I think the cost cutting won't return in anywhere near the same way. I think there's been an embracing of things like spending on projects that will lead to growth so infrastructure spending in in the us whether it's on green infrastructure or not here in the uk same thing you know creating jobs creating wealth and then perhaps increasing or tweaking some of the tax bands to to gain back some of that revenue it, you know it's a difficult one for a government um to do but taxing the super rich and i mean you know by super rich i mean hundreds of millions of pounds in cash assets that sounds like something that you could see doing. But, you know, it's a very select group of people. I'm not sure it's that easy. The other thing I think you could see is if I were a government looking to tax someone, those big tech companies we were talking about, um, you know, give them an option. Do they want more government scrutiny and regulation or would they perhaps like to pay some of those billions into government coffers? That's the way I would be expecting government policy to go. Companies paying more in the way of tax super rich individuals paying more in the way of tax presented to the wider population as reduction of inequality. I, I could probably sell that as a politician. Yes. Good. Yes, I think, yeah, that's, that's a very good answer. Thanks. And um, just in, in terms of tax, just a sort of a, an early sort of heads up. Um, obviously, in the UK here, we've had a, a, a budget announced for the 3rd of March. So um, we will be hosting another webinar, hopefully, very shortly after that, just to look at there are any tax implications um, for our clients that need to be considered um, as part of their financial plan. So do look out for sort of invitations around that um, in a month or two's time. Um, but I, I think we're out of time now. We're just slightly overrun. So I think we need to sort of call time and bring proceedings to a halt. Um, as I said, if there are any other questions that have been prompted from this webinar, then please sort of feed them back to us. Um, come back via your normal sort of wealth manager contact. Um, we will also be sending out a feedback questionnaire um, after the webinar's finished and we'd be very grateful if you could complete that. Um, the feedback is very useful and also gives you the opportunity to ask um, and suggest some topics you might want to see covered in the future. Um, so before I, uh, before I go and close the call, um, just like thanks Ben again for his time um, today. Uh, very interesting and very insightful. I'm sure you'll agree. And um, thank you all for joining us too. So hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and I look forward to seeing you again soon.